Oh, Vincent Vega, our man in Amsterdam. Jules Winfield, our man in Inglewood. Get your asses out in here. Where's the big man? Big man's right over there taking care of some business. Why don't you hang back for a second or two, you know? When you see the white boy leave, just go on over. How you been? I've been doing pretty good about yourself. All right. So I hear you taking me out tomorrow. At Marcellus's request. Have you met me? Not yet. <laughs> so fucking funny. You got the thing. I got the bitch. Look, I'm not a fucking idiot, all right? It's a big man's wife. I'm gonna sit across from her, chew my food with my mouth closed, laugh at her fucking jokes, and that's it. Hey, my name's Paul, and this shit's between my next guest is a writer and actor whose shows and films include 21 Grams, Pulp Fiction, Fear the Walking Dead, Boardwalk Empire. Uh, he's been a fixture on the big and small screen for many years. Welcome the super talented. His name is Paul Yall, Paul Calderon. Paul, thank you for coming on the show today. How's life? How you been? Well, thank you for inviting me, Derek, and uh, life's good. And yeah, I mean, I can't complain. Uh, the kid who grew up in Puerto Rico on a farm with um, no electricity, no running water, has done pretty good for himself. Uh, yeah, not bad. Yeah. Not bad, he, but he, you know what? <laughs> um, do, do, Paul, yeah, do, you ever go, do you ever go back to Puerto Rico? Have you been Have you been back? I've been back several times, you know. it's. Um, I still have family back there, but, um, you know, since my mom passed about 10 years ago, I... Yeah, I don't see any reason to go back. You know, things are pretty challenging back on the island. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I'm kind of like, you know, I moved to New York in many years ago, and I just consider myself a New Yorker, more of a New Yorker than a Puerto Rican, really. You know, mm. although I speak the language and I love the culture, you know. But, you know, when you grew up in New York and Lower East Side and Spanish Harlem, that kind of gets... Kind of programs you, you know, to think in a different way. Yeah, I mean, you moved to Spanish Harlem. I mean, uh, you know, it's a tough area of New York. Um, do you find that they made, that made, that move, that environment, uh, made an impact on who you are today, Paul? Did that have a big impact on you as a human being? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, we moved here, uh, my mom and I, when I was six, and our first apartment was on 3rd Street and Avenue C. That was when the Lower East Side was the Lower East Side. And, you know, just violence, you know, day in and day out. Then we moved to 5th Street and Avenue B. And years later, uh, 10 years later, we moved to Spanish Harlem. And there was, you know, it's streets, you know, ghettos. And just, I just saw life in a different way than somebody who kind of like maybe grew up in the suburbs, you know, it kind of like conditioned me to view life in a different way, not a better way or a worse, a worse way, it's just a different way. How old were you, Paul, when you when you left um, Puerto Rico? I was six. So do you, do you, can you remember any of that time or were you just simply too young? Oh, no, I remember. I, I, I go back to when I was three years old. I remember things very, very, very clearly from, uh, you know, three on, you know, from the age of three on. And it was beautiful up there. You know, my grandfather had a tobacco farm. There were horses and cows and pigs and chickens and and it was very idyllic up there. And I remember it fondly and I remember when I got to the States, when I got to the Lower East Side, I complained to my mom. I said, Mom, I can't see the sky because of yeah, the buildings. I said, I want to go back. I can't see the sky. <laughs> That's great. I mean, it, 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 that transition for you, it's a different kind of tough, right? Because it was tough. I imagine it's not easy living on a farm. I mean, there's worse ways, but it's not easy. And, and I'm sure it wasn't easy when you first got to New York, like you had mentioned. I mean, it's that, that was probably a, a different type of, of, of difficulty for you uh, being that young, right? Yeah, you know, excuse me. Yeah, uh, you know, we didn't have any, back in Puerto Rico, we didn't have any running water. We didn't have any electricity. Um, it, it was just 
just very, um, it, it, we didn't, there were no roads leading up to my grandfather's farm. So it was very kind of, I don't want to say primitive, but I, I don't want to say there was no electricity. There was no running water. Mm. We didn't have glass windows. We didn't have any, the, the latrine was outside, you know, uh, it, the, the toilet was not inside. Uh, so when we moved to, um, when we moved to New York, yeah, it was tough because I didn't understand, you know, I didn't speak any English. So, and we didn't have any bilingual education back then. So mm-hmm. it's kind of like you get thrown into the school system and you're, you're asked to do as well as everybody else, even though you can't speak the language and you're not getting any help. I couldn't get any help at home because my mom didn't speak any English either. So I was like, oh shit, what do I do? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point you make. You know, I mean, now it's a, it's a little bit better, right? Because they have you know ESL. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's like back then, I, I can't even imagine what it must have been. It must have been like being on a different planet. I mean, you don't know what people are saying. I mean, that's tough for you. Well, you know, it was tough. It was uh, scary. But you know, you gotta survive and you go through it, and hopefully, just made me a little bit stronger. You mm. know. And I thought I read, Paul, where you were a pretty good baseball player. You had a shoulder injury that, that kind of, you know, made that dream kind of evaporate. But I, but I thought I read where you were a pretty decent baseball player. Yeah, you know, I was a pitcher. I threw pretty hard, you know. And, um, yeah, you know, as a scout for the Pirates, um, wanted to sign me. And, but, but my arm kind of blew. You know, mm-hmm. and I went into a deep funk because that's all I ever wanted to, to be was uh, a baseball player. You know, even if I didn't reach the uh, the majors, I said, "Hey, listen, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll be content with playing in the minors." You know, that was my dream. I just loved baseball. You know. Yeah, and, and kind of walk me through the timeline. So then you 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 end up in the army. Um, talk a little bit about that time of your life. Is that is that was that a very favorable time in your life? Were you confused? Were you kind of disappointed from the baseball thing? How, how what's your oh, mindset at that time, Paul? Oh, you know, I, I fell into a deep funk for about two, three years after the uh, baseball injury, and I tried going to school. I tried going to college, um, a city college here in the city, and I just, oh, man. I, <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I didn't have sports to rely on, I just I just couldn't focus. And I said, I'm going to go crazy, you know. And uh, I said, what can I do? And somebody suggested, you know, joining the service. And I did. And, uh, the four months that I spent in boot camp were probably some of the best experiences I've ever had. Because, you know, the drill sergeants back then were ex-Vietnam vets. And they were really, really Stuff. Mm. And um, uh, uh, I kind of thrive. Then you know you get you get stationed overseas, and kind of it's like any you know everything else. Kind of like you're just um, meandering around. Kind of like the, the purpose of having a goal of getting through boot camp. Kind of less than just kind of like okay, what do I do now? All right, and uh, and. I got out, you know. Uh, my family was in trouble back home, and I asked for a hardship discharge because I was the oldest in the family, and my youngest brother was running a little bit wild, and I had to come back and be kind of like a father figure for my younger uh, brothers and sister. Yeah, and then you find your way through the GI Bill into acting, right? That's how you get your first. Uh, that's how you get your feet wet, right? Yep. Yeah, and so let me ask you, so who do you credit today to t- really giving you that education, that jump into becoming, you know, really making a big stride as an actor, right? Because at the time you're coming off of a funk. I mean, you got another hardship, you know, with your family. So you're dealing with a lot here. Well, who's the person maybe or, or people that turn it around for you that that you credit to kind of maybe turning it, having your life go in a, a different direction? You know, it has to be two people. You know, one of them is my wife. Um, after 42 years, we're still together. Um, wow. I met her first day of acting school. I met her. And we just kind of like hit it off. And if it, if it hadn't been for her, I probably would have quit acting, gotten back to the service. 
because I just kind of like, you know, acting back then. I mean, you know, <laughs> we had no cell phones, we had no videos, we, you know, it was kind of like, it was, you know, we didn't have any cable networks, it was just ABC, CBS, NBC, and we didn't have too many uh, Hispanic actors or too many actors of color. And it was, um, it was very challenging uh, to come up that way. Uh, uh, my teacher, Irene Moore, uh, was an amazing teacher, and she was instrumental in drilling sort of the discipline of the work into me, which I kind of rebelled against, unfortunately, you know, because mm. I was always very rebellious by nature, mm. and we had a falling out. Years later, I realized, you know, what an amazing uh, gift she was for me, you know, in forging that kind of discipline in, in the work. So between those two, you know, uh, you know, my wife, Kathy, and my teacher, Irene Moore, she was the most instrumental as far as acting teachers um, so, so as a fan, when you when you look at the you know the the, the film industry, uh, TV industry, is there an actor that you say, my God, I want to be like that? That's the actor I want to be like. That's the one I want to pattern my career after. Wow, you know that's a that's a great, great, great question. <clears throat> uh, you know, I was always a great, huge fan of cinema. Um, you know, I loved Nicholson, Brando, uh, De Niro. But the guy that turned it around for me, I was ready to quit back in 1979, 80. And, I, it, it, you know, acting just wasn't doing it for me. I just felt like, you know, it's just so mundane, just, you know, it, auditioning and burning lines and this and that. I said, there's got to be something more transcendent to this. And then I went to see um, Werner Herzog's Agile, The Wrath of God starring Klaus Kinski at the um, I think it was at the uh, Regency here in Manhattan and I just left like blown away. I just left kind of like uh, stumbling. I said, Jesus Christ. I said, that's what's possible. And then from that day on, I kind of like just decided that I was going to pursue um, the career, you know, as opposed to uh, maybe I will, maybe I won't. It was like, okay, that was the turning point, going to see that film, watching that performance. Uh, it just blew me away. Yeah, and I always talk about on my show the power of cinema or the power of theater or the power of, you know, TV. It's just, it's amazing how it can have an effect on you. I wanted to ask, so in researching your life, Paul, you know, when it came to Bad Lieutenant, phenomenal movie, I know you co-wrote that. Why does IMDb leave your name off of that? Because you, you co-wrote it. Why wouldn't they put it on there? Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. You know, I, I don't want to get into it. Yeah. I, you know, I, I don't know the... Uh, the ins and outs of that. I don't want to get into it. You know, I I love Abel. Um, I just saw him a few weeks ago. You know, I, I just, I don't know. And I, to tell you the truth, <laughs> I really don't care because, you know, if I, if I was to give it any time inside my head, I, you know, I'd be wasting time. So yeah, I'd rather yeah. not. Yeah, I, I didn't know anything about a backstory. And I just was like, you know, that's because I was researching your whole filmography. I'm like, that's weird. He's a writer and they left it out. But um, the other thing I wanted to ask you is what, did, what was your and, and if you don't want to get into this either, that's OK. What, what was your take on the remake in 2009? Of the Bad Lieutenant? Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I don't. I, I didn't see it. Okay. <laughs> I, I didn't want to see it. Yeah, and, and I, I got to tell you, I don't get. There's so many original screenwriters out there, Paul. I don't know why they keep remaking things when there's so much original content available. Like I don't, it's it's perplexing to me. There's so much great writing out there, and yet we keep rehashing. Like Bad Lieutenant was done really, really well the first time. There's, it's completely unnecessary to go back down that road again, right? 
I I would think so. Yeah. So I don't know, but but you are a big theater guy, right? Like you are still you were and you are a big theater. I mean, not all actors I have on the show have, have the theater background you do. Is that would you say your heart and soul is in the theater, or, or is it just simply in acting? Uh, it's yeah, that's, a, that's an amazing question. You know, I love theater that can unsettle an audience, but there's hardly enough of that going on. I think right now during these times, you know, people just want to be politically correct with what they're putting out. Mm -hmm. But my, you know, I am co-artistic director of a theater company here in the city called Primitive Grace. We've been in existence for um, four and a half years. Mm -hmm. We've put up um, a handful of productions, you know, three of the plays I wrote, I directed, uh, two of them them I acted in. And uh, we're planning our next production in the fall. And I was also one of the co-founders of the Labyrinth Theater Company, which is still going strong. So I, I just find that in theater, you can get really down and dirty. Mm. It's an opportunity for that, that what you put out is what you're going to see as opposed to, you know what, we just shot like 20,000 hours and we're just going to show like 90 minutes of it. And we don't know what's going to, what's going to, what's going to come out, you know, what's going to be shown at the theaters. Yeah. And, you know, I had a screenwriter on, he just, he just released um, a movie on Netflix about Ted Bundy. And I asked him if any actors ever said, you know, like, thank you or wow, you know, that's an amazing scene you wrote or, and he said, he goes, his, his, his answer was long, but in, in summation, he said, you can always tell the theater people versus the non-theater people, the act, theater actors versus non-theater actors. He wasn't, yes. anyone, yeah, he was, <laughs> he was paying a huge compliment to those who spent time in the theater and their gratefulness, I think, for well-written stories. Yes, 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 yes. It's a different approach to acting, you know, all in all. Yeah, and I'm looking at your um, filmography, and you've worked for some amazing directors. Just to go through a few of them for the listeners, Mangold, uh, Tarantino, Soderbergh, you worked for Spike and Scorsese, and and, and just so many. Um, Can you tell what makes them special? Can Can you say to yourself, wow, this is what makes... Martin special. This is what makes Spike special. Can you see it, or is it just they're just simply great? Is there something specific about them? You know, each of them is very different. Each of them brings their own individuality um, to the set. You know, like Scorsese, he's very kind of like improvisation. You know, Spike, you know, gives you leeway to play. Uh, Soderbergh, he's very by the numbers, but at the same time, he says very little. I think the best ones, you know, like Lamette was amazing, but, mm-hmm. you know, we had two weeks to rehearse. Each of them, the best ones say very little. Right, right. No, that makes sense. Um, do you find yourself still learning from them? Like, even though you've you got a new Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you have to, you know, you have to, you have to stay open else you kind of like, you know, you become a closed book, uh, you know, you put yourself in a box and nothing can come in. So I'm constantly trying to learn what the hell can I learn just from watching a film. I was watching a film from 1950, uh, an old American film, but starring this amazing Austrian actor, uh, Werner Herzog. And I said, holy shit, <laughs> look at this guy. I, I said, look at this guy. And he's just, you know, one of the most amazing actors ever on cinema, but hardly anyone knows who he is. Right, right. No, and that's well said. And, you know, when you find yourself working today in, in television or, or in the movies, do you get, I, don't, I want to be careful how I phrase this. Do you get frustrated after, you know, some of the people you've worked for are amazing. Do you get frustrated at the younger directors who maybe maybe are a little bit green? Um, not, do you find yourself kind of, I don't know, holding back? Does that ever happen? Holding back uh, in what sense? Um, 
Well, so 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 somebody's green, right? They're prone to mistakes. They're prone to maybe doing something where you're like, as a veteran actor, you're like, maybe to yourself, you're like, geez, you know, I don't know about that. Like, do you ever? Is it tougher to work with with newer directors that may or may not have the knowledge, the experience, the background to really go down the same roads as some of the past directors you've had have done? Does that make any sense? Yes. Of course, yeah. I mean, you know, the the greener ones kind of like they just talk too much. Right. They just talk too much. Theater, that's great. You know, you want to be able to discuss character and this and that, but for film, uh, you know, it's just you have to choose your words wisely, and you have what are you going to say, and how are you going to say it. As opposed to just opening your mouth and just talking, <laughs> you know. Uh, so I'm not saying that all of them are like that, but too many of them just talk too much. Right, 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 right. And, and you clearly said before the what the, a lot of these great directors have in common is the, they they let their actions speak more than they do their mouths. Right? It's it's what they what they do, and it's it's, it's it makes perfect sense to me, Paul. Yeah, and you, you know, you kind of like, you know, you pose the direction as a question, as a simple question. Yeah. You know, do you, yeah. do you think you would stand here? Do you think you would sit? Do you, you know, get so you, you put it in the actor's hands as opposed to, no, I want you to do this and that, I want that, I want this. And all of a sudden the actor feels, okay, well, why don't you get up here and perform <laughs> <laughs> and do the role, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that makes perfect sense. And, you know, on the acting side of things, my God, you're with Pacino, Redford, Walken, Nolte, Buscemi, Melissa Leo, Benicio Del Toro, who's amazing. Um, I got to believe you find yourself learning with people like that, and, and they're probably learning from you, too. Yeah, you know, uh, I am. Um, here's the thing is that you can you learn from everyone. You learn from the greats, you learn from the people who are not that good because you realize, oh, shit, they're doing something that's not working and they shouldn't be doing this. I got I to gotta watch that in myself. Right. You know, with the great ones like Rafa Pacino, Cartel, Walker, Nolte. <laughs> and no, no, you just, you just watch. You just watch. You just watch. You just watch. You, you try to absorb what's going on. You know, I had the luxury of working with uh, De Niro for about six months, you know, I, and in a play that we did back in 86, and that was like every day, I was just kind of like just be so attentive to mm. everything that he was doing, you know. Right, right. No, that's well said. And do you find yourself, because now, I mean, I mean, you're an amazing actor. You've got this amazing background and filmography. Do, you, do younger actors, because I know I would if I was an actor, do they approach you and say, you know, Paul, what would you do here? Like, how would you handle this? What, and I'm not talking, we're going to get to your teaching in a second. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about on a set. Do you ever have younger actors come up to you and say, Paul, wh wh what would you do here? Yeah, I'm very humbled by that. You know, um, actors to approach me, the younger ones, and then you have others that you would think should not be approaching you, but they ask you for your advice. Mm, mm. You know, they ask you, do you think this is working? Do you think this, you know, because so they, 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 and sometimes I say, well, you know, maybe you think about this, or maybe you think about that. And so I'm very humble, you know, by that. But they, you know, if they ask me, and I'm not, I'm, I am never going to cross the line and say, hey, listen, hey, kid, or oh, hey, you, you know, that's not working. Listen, no, but if, if a young actor is in trouble, I will take him aside and say, hey, listen, think about doing this or think about doing that. And I have done that, you know, with the more mature actors that have been around, you know, right. if they ask me something, I'll just, you know, I'll be as simple as possible. And some, many times I'll just say, hey, listen, what you're doing is great. <laughs> just yeah. trust yourself, you know? Right, right. No, and that's, you know, I think that's the theme today, Paul, is, you know, I don't care what you do for, for a living. If you want to get better, use your ears more than you do your mouth, right? I mean, that's... Oh, God, yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. yes, yes, um, yes. And be attentive, be attentive, because, you know, a lot of young actors are just on their phones, 
you know, most of the time on set, you know. Yeah, that's that's ins- to me that's insane because one, it's tough to get in that position. I mean, Christopher Nolan, the director, doesn't allow cell phones anywhere near the set. So I mean, I just I don't know. I don't know how be getting in the position to these actors get in is very very difficult, right? It's it's, it's like one in a million chance, right? I would yeah. think that you take your cell phone, shut it off, and leave it or leave it at home because my God, I, I don't know. I to me that's insane, Paul. That's crazy. It is. You it know? is. You know. It is. By the way, you were phenomenal in Fear the Walking Dead. I was hoping you'd be around a lot. When I saw you, I started pumping my fist. I'm like, all right, he's back. I love it. Uh, well, that was a, that was a great experience, you know, working with the, uh, with the people there and working with uh, Frank Delane, who's uh, an amazing young actor. And it was, a, it was a great treat. Yeah, you stole my next question. I was going to ask you about, you know, we were talking about younger actors. Boy, has Frank Delane got some potential, huh? Oh, my God. He's just, uh, you know... Many times you go up on set and you know you ask the other actor, "Hey, you want to run lines?" You know, as a theater actor, that's what you do. But right. a lot of them, they say, "Nah, I don't want to run lines." Okay. With Frank, I remember the first time, first day, he said, "Hey, uh, do you mind running lines?" <laughs> so then, for the next four or five months, while we were in Mexico, we would just either he would either come to my hotel room, I would go to his hotel room, and we would. Um, Explore the scenes line by line, you know, transition by transition. He was so, but he comes from a theater background. You know, his mom is a director. His dad is a, a, a well-known actor. Yeah. So he comes from that. Uh, it, it, he, it's in the blood, but he he is very disciplined about his his work, about his art. I. He's there 150 percent, and I can't speak um, enough about him. You know, as you know, regarding his art and his willingness to work on scenes, which yeah. it's rare. It's rare. You know, uh, I can the actors that have that a rare ability and just willing to work on a scene as opposed to ah we'll wing it you know, we'll get up there we'll wing it but no he, he really wanted to get underneath underneath each moment and you know he would ask me questions and so it was an amazing experience working with Frank yeah and, and you said it his dad Stephen is, is from the Game of Thrones uh, one of the lift, most recently you know where he played Stannis Baratheon just a great actor you know and boy that's got to be refreshing Paul to have an he's kind of an old school guy you know in, in, in a young man's body right wanting to do the right things not just kind of on his cell phone blowing things off like that's the kind of attitude that successful and great actors have right yeah, exactly it's the uh, that discipline you know the discipline is imagine you know like a baseball player going out on the field and taking his cell phone um, out onto the field or or he goes out to take fielding practice but in between every ground ball he's on his cell phone I mean <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't imagine that uh, uh, an athlete a ball player doing that or a boxer between rounds taking his fucking cell phone you know and sending pictures of themselves in the fight it's just that's crazy. That's know. crazy. It's You're funny. so right. It's crazy. And you can tell with the scenes, and I remember watching this, when, when you, the, you, had, you had scenes with, with Frank, and the two of you, you could tell it just worked so well. I mean, I didn't know that you guys discussed dialogue off, off camera, but it's clear that you're watching two actors that are proud and care about what they're putting forth, the product that they're putting forth. You can, that's very, very obvious. Yeah, I mean, he, like, you know, I'll say it again, he just wanted to be on point with each and every single line, word, moment, and we would just spend hours just exploring it, and that's such a rare find nowadays, because actors just don't want to put that amount of work yeah, and you were great. Do think. Yeah, and you were great on the Talking Dead. You were on an episode of the Talking Dead afterwards, and I, and I know people loved your character. So, yeah, man, that was just a great role. I loved watching you, and thank you for such an awesome performance. 
Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Um, the other performance, Mike, and this might be, you're in a couple of underrated things, and one of them is Boardwalk Empire. I mean, it's one of the greatest shows <laughs> of all time. And he is, I want to tell you, that is one of the, I think it was, Ar- is his name Archimedes? Am I, am I have that right? Yeah. yeah. One of the, I would never mess with this person, ever. Like, and it was such a phenomenal performance. Did you have a lot of fun in that role? Is it fun to be that guy? You know, it was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> I didn't say much, but that yeah, that it was a very challenging role because I had to be. You know, I saw I saw the character as kind of like a a cat. He had to be present each and every moment. So whenever I was on set in a scene, I had to be present. I had to be thinking in character, as opposed to oh shit, I'm just gonna hit my mark and just. You know, look at my line and just pretend that I'm here. No, I have to be there as present as possible. So it was a very challenging, challenging role in that sense that I couldn't rely on much dialogue. I couldn't rely on too much uh, uh, physicality or props or anything. It was just just be there and be present. So that was uh, that was an extreme challenge, which I really appreciated. No, I'm telling you, if anybody hasn't seen Boardwalk Empire, they're one, they're nuts, and two, I mean, it's just a phenomenal performance. And you know who takes a lot of unnecessary shit, I feel like, uh, Paul, is Steve Buscemi. He's such a good actor. You know, when that show was on, I remember people saying, oh, he's not this, he's not that. Steve Buscemi is a phenomenal actor. Steve is amazing. You know, I met Steve back in, when was it, 88, 89? I'm King of New York, and we did another silly little film down in Miami. Uh, and I think we did something else I can't remember, but uh, he's, he's extremely underrated as an actor because mm-hmm. he has this ability to uh, be comedic and be dramatic. Right. And that is so, 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 so rare. Yep. 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 I, 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 complete, I completely agree. Completely. And he's the same. He gives you 150% each moment, each moment. I remember one time they gave him a, a monologue on Boardwalk Empire that they had just written like two hours before. And uh, and he was talking to me. And then when the camera turned around and it's my POV, it's his POV of me, I just said, hey, Steve, why don't you just hold the script? <laughs> <laughs> That, that just says a lot, you know. And you know, you're in so 21 Grams, uh, Last Castle, uh, Oxygen is another underrated movie with another phenomenal actor, Adrian Brody. Yeah, that was a small little film that kind of like um, a lot of people haven't seen. Really good, like really good people who haven't seen. That's another like underrated, really good film, you know. And I and I and I, I remember seeing you on Miami Vice, which was my favorite show of all time. Um, Pulp Fiction Is Quentin Tarantino a fan As much as he, like, he, he strikes me as a guy that just Loves every minute of being a director But you talk about a guy that I, I've never seen him off camera But I bet you he's the opposite of what you're saying Right because he's definitely talented But he seems like a guy that talks a lot uh, You know As a director as a director, right, because he's cause, cause he's so invested in his work, right, because he writes a lot of it. He, As a director, Quentin seems like he's he's such a fan of what he does, right? I don't think he does anything he doesn't want to. I think he believes wholeheartedly in everything. But I would imagine as a director, he's is he a guy that talks a lot because he's so passionate about what he does? You know what? He's, he does not. He pulls you aside, you know, which a lot of directors nowadays don't do. He pulls you aside and he gives you an adjustment. Right. And 90% of the times, you know, he, he would pose it as a question. You know, and it's just very tiny, just very small adjustments. You know, he wouldn't pull you aside and start talking about this and that. No, he's, whatever his adjustments are, they're very focused, they're, they're, they're very compact. Yeah, and, and, they're not rambling. They're not rambling. It looks like he would be rambling, but he is not. 
Right, right. And he definitely seems like a director that just is is top shelf. And, you know, I thought I read where, where, where he was so impressed by your audition uh, for Jules where he said, I, I got to get you, I got to get you in this movie. Is that a true story? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 How does it feel to be in a movie like that? Like, I mean, you're in a lot of iconic things, but that's a pretty special movie, Pulp Fiction. I mean, that's, you know, on a lot of people's top five list. For you, is it any different than any other movie you've done? Is it? Is it? Does it have more meaning? Is it more special? What's your perspective on, on Pulp Fiction, Paul? Well, you know, it's an amazing film. It's a groundbreaking film. Um, amazing talent in the film, you know, with uh, Sam and... Uh, John and Harvey and Chris and it, you know it's, it's one of those iconic films that will kind you know, of like a Citizen Kane kind of film on the waterfront kind of film like it, it, it's kind of it's it's much part of its time and it it will have this kind of like undying um um, effect because I think the nothing against the film that won that year, which I think was Forrest Gump, but right. uh, it's you know I, I think like a Forrest Gump will come and go with a Pulp Fiction. I think it'll you know it'll always be there. Yeah, and and that was the greatest year for. I mean, it was Pulp Fiction, Forrest Gump, and the Shawshank Redemption. I mean, yeah, oh well, god, I yeah. dare you to find me three movies that good. In that category, again, it'll never happen again, ever. Yeah, which is amazing. Well, one year, I think they had Network, Taxi Driver, Rocky, and something else. Oh, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty good, too. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good, too. Um, yeah. So I talk about mentors before. You've mentored some pretty good people, um, two of which are, are Sam Rockwell and, and Philip Seymour Hoffman. Is that true? Well, you know, I was kind of like the elder statesman of the theater company, Um during that time, uh, Sam, I, I I knew since he was a teenager, we had the, uh, the same agent, uh, Michael Kingman, who was an amazing uh, agent. He has passed away. So, I, I, you know, I remember I directing Sam in one of the earlier productions with the Labyrinth Theater Company, and I remember uh, calling him and saying, Sam, I need to get you a script. She so said, yeah, I'm working today. Can you, can you, are you going to be downtown? Because he used to live down on Thompson Street. And I said, sure. So um, he was working at, working at Burritoville, delivering burritos. <laughs> <laughs> and he was sitting on the bench inside Burritoville waiting for his next delivery. And I sat next to him because this, you have to remember, this is before emails. This is for attachments. You had to kind of like hand deliver scripts. <laughs> and I remember just sitting next to him and handing him the uh, script and telling him, you know, what I wanted and this and that. And, you know, I'll, I'll always have a soft spot. And he'll always be kind of like, I know he's like 48. <laughs> wow. But, you know, to me, he'll always be, you know, and we did a series back in the 80s together, Dream Street. Wow. Uh, in, yeah. in Newark, in Newark, uh, New Jersey. So, and he was a teenager back then. So, you know, he'll, he, 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 and he's, he's got to be one of the sweetest, most unaffected guys that you'll ever meet, you yeah. know? Yeah. How about Philip? How about Philip? Well, Phil, you know, uh, I remember him interviewing for our theater company, and someone had shown me a clip of um, a speech that he had. Uh, from a production that he had been in 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 Europe, a uh, theater production called Operations, uh, was directed by Peter Sellers, the uh, the director. And wow. when they showed it to me, I said, "Holy shit, who the fuck is this?" <laughs> <laughs> and then I met him, and then I cast him in I think the first production that he he was ever in at Labyrinth as an actor. He played this retarded guy, and uh, and then I. Yeah, you got cast him again, another stage reading that I had, and he was just, I mean, amazing right right from the start. You knew that he had that extra uh, gear as an actor. Even Sam would say, you know, he should say, you know, Phil, Jesus Christ, you know, because we, we, we did a little uh, uh, 
passion together. I mean, we just feel was always on a different gear. Yeah, and I gotta say, do you know a guy named um, Austin Pendleton? Yes. Yeah. So yes. Austin said uh, he was on my show earlier. He said, and, and Austin is a huge theater guy like you are. He said uh, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman auditioned for something, and. Austin Pendleton said he had to take a step back because he had never seen something or someone this good. Yeah, I mean yeah. that's how that's how good um, uh, Phil was. I mean, again, he was on a different uh, a different gear, and you know, I acted opposite him. You know, in this play that we did back at Labyrinth, and which I was still directing, then I directed him again this other piece, and. He was just, okay, this is the guy that you want, no matter what the role, he'll get it. He'll get it, and he'll give you that extra extra thing that maybe 1% of actors will give you. Yeah, yeah, no, that's really well said, Paul. Um, Paul, do you still teach at the NYU Film School? No, I did for about seven years. You know, they brought me in to teach first-year graduate directors. Um, and I did, and it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it, and you know, I tried mentoring the up and coming directors. I was trying to teach them uh, language, uh, film language, as far as a director with actors. I would bring actors from the outside for them to work with. So that was an amazing, you know, an amazing experience for the uh, seven years that uh, uh, that was involved there. Um, and I wanted to ask you, so whether it's a mentorship or, or teaching at NYU like you did, can you tell early on whether somebody really has it or whether they really do not? Like, can you tell relatively early? Well, you know, I, that's a great question because I'm still teaching. I teach private classes here in the city. Wow. And wow. I, because I, I, I get such great benefits from teaching because it just keeps me sharp. You know, so sometimes you see someone, um, I remember uh, teaching at an institute, I won't name the institute, uh, some years back, and I remember seeing, taking aside two actors and telling them, listen, don't let the process here fuck up your innate attempt. Right. Uh, You have something special don't let people screw with it. Right. Uh, then you have other actors that will surprise you, that start off very slowly. All of a sudden, you, you, you say to yourself, man, this guy's not going anywhere, you know? And all of a sudden, boom, you know, Benicio surprised the shit out of me because I worked with him when he was either 19 or 20 on a Miami Vice episode. And he was very green. Right. And I said, man, this kid needs a lot of work. And then the next time I saw him was on 21 grams. <laughs> wow. So uh, I would never have expected something like that from Benicio, but there you go. He's, you know, he went to New York. He studied at the Stella Adler uh, studio, and he really took it seriously, and he really... Uh, Put the work in. You know, you have to sacrifice to re- be a really good actor. You know, time, money, um, uh, social, uh, your social life suffers because if it's if it's an art form, you have to sacrifice for it. Else, you're just gonna you just scratch its surface. Yeah, that's well said. I mean, Benicio Del Toro's performance in Traffic might be one of the top ten I've ever seen of all time. I mean, it's... Oh, yeah, he's just amazing. He's, he's just amazing. He's obnoxiously good. It's, um, yeah, amazing is, is the perfect word. Um, you know, I did want to ask you, um, when you... Early on, we talked about how you learned English, right? So you were, you were younger then. Do you find that whatever you did to learn English, do you find that any of that transcends into acting? Did you find that as you got became an adult... It was the same kind of method of learning, right? Because to learn a whole new language and to learn a script involves some of the same skills, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean that, you that, know, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Go on. Go on. No, yeah. Because I was, I was thinking to myself as you were speaking. I'm like, you know, the the fact that the, the way you talk, it's it's almost like you know, you were talking earlier about learning a you know, language. You know, when you really had no 
resources, you had to kind of grind through it. And I would imagine learning lines is, is, is almost identical to that same kind of process as an adult, you know? Yeah. You know, for me, it's always been, I've always been like a, a physical learner. So can I inhabit what I'm saying physically? And yeah, that's all I can say about that is I just need to inhabit whatever I'm doing as opposed to let me just overly analyze something. Yeah, I can do that as well, but if I don't inhabit it physically, then I'm just stuck up in my head. Yeah, and I can't even imagine what it's like having you as a mentor. It's like having uh, Aaron Judge teach a batting practice, right? It's like, I mean, an accomplished actor teaching classes like you do. I mean, that must be, that must be like, I don't know. I mean, if I was, if I wanted to become an actor, to me, you're as good as they come. And I mean, are people? Do you find that they're a little bit taken back when you when you're teaching, or are they kind of like just all invested in, in what you have to say? Well, you know. You have the uh, the people who come in, they really want to learn, they really say, well, this guy's been around for 40 plus years, and he's worked with this person and that person, he does both film and TV and theater, and I just kind of shut my mouth and, <laughs> and, and learn, and then you have the other ones that, you see, the problem with acting and acting school, acting schools, I should say, or acting, you know, uh, workshops or whatever it is that uh, nowadays people think that it's a, it, you put in three months, six months, a year, two years, and then you kind of like you're done. Uh, and most actors just want to learn lines and face each other and that's it. Right, right. I just come to it from a totally different uh, perspective where it's, listen, you have to knit the moments together. You have to breathe through the moments. You have to understand so many little things if you want to excel at this. If you don't, just tell me and I won't waste my breath. Right. And there are actors that are willing to, uh, students that are willing to go through that, but that's a lot of work. Yes. And they're willing to go through it. But then you have the others that say, well, you know, I'd rather go to another school where it's just, uh, I'm just going to put up a scene and they're just going to let me do the scene and then they're going to tell me whether, whether it worked or it didn't and then we'll do it again. And so here, you can start a scene. I'll stop you before you even open your mouth because I see that it's, you're not really inhabiting the scene. Uh, you can get two, three, four lines into it and I'll stop you again because you're not really finding the moment. And that's, anyway, that's all I can say about that is you have the students that are, that are saying, okay, I can learn something from this guy or you know what? But this guy has to offer, uh, I'd rather go somewhere else. And Paul, again, the theme of the, the theme of the interview, right? Using your ears more than your mouth, and that's a perfect example of it. Yeah. You know, uh, my last question for you, Paul. Thank you so much for giving me forty five minutes. I, I can't thank you enough. I really appreciate it. I didn't know it was forty five. Yeah, that, <laughs> I thought that, it was like fifteen. That's good, man. That's good. Um, yeah. So you're the you're. I, I'm clearly a fan. I, I appreciate you as a professional. Um, are we in a better place? in 2019 with movies and television than we were say 20 or 30 years ago has it gotten better has it gotten worse is it both a little of both what's your take on that uh, well you know it's gotten better because you know there's so many opportunities like, so many more opportunities mm -hmm. than when I was first coming up um, you know I tell people yeah we had CBS NBC and ABC <laughs> 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 and that was it you know and you had primetime TV you know you had the nighttime sh shows some of them shot New York some of them shot in LA and uh, uh, now you know between Hulu and Netflix and Amazon and Stars and, and plus CBS and ABC and NBC and HBO and Showtime I mean it's an amazing time for actors uh, it's an amazing time for actors period but then actors of color especially because there are so many more opportunities than they were when I was you know coming up yeah. it's an amazing time it is an amazing time you know and the writing for TV 
uh, especially for, you know, Showtime and Amazon and Hulu. I mean, the writing is many times better than the writing in movies. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, I never thought about it that way. You know, the, the fact that, you know, there are the Netflix and the Hulus and, and it creates more opportunity to, keep, you know, at least culturally, we can see more of, of what we should be seeing where it's not limited to just the three channels. I mean, I remember my, when I was younger, not only did we have the three channels, Paul, there was no remote control. So I had to get up. My dad would say, get up and change the channel. You know, that's, that's what I remember, you know. Well, I remember putting the wire hanger for an antenna because we, could, we, we weren't getting getting good reception you know uh paul did you want to promote anything get anything out there do i what did you want to promote anything get anything out there any projects or or, or what have you is there anything you wanted to promote anything get out get anything out there no you know uh, i've been involved with bosch on amazon over the last three years that's an excellent show great show uh, great show. Snyder's well is amazing in it great people jamie Hector as well and you know i believe that it's um uh, it's a good enough show to tune into and watch, and yeah, it's easily it's easily the best show on Prime. It's absolute. It's it's a great. It's an absolute. If people are looking for a show to binge watch, recommend Bosch hundred percent. And that's it. You know, the writing there is um, uh, it's it's really 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 good. Yeah, you know, I lied. I have one more question, Paul. Do you is yeah. it is it frustrating? Because I know theater usually has one director. A movie has one director. Does it ever get frustrating in a series where you have multiple directors and one is picking up where the other one left off? Does it ever get to you, or is it just like, you know what, I do my job no matter what? Yeah, well, you know, that's a very sensitive um, subject, you know, because, you know, on Bosch, we have Ernest Dickerson comes in and directs two shows uh, per season. Right. And he says very little. And I always thank him. You know, the last three seasons, I went up to him and I thanked him. I said, for saying very little. And he said, why should I say much when you guys already know the characters? Right. Uh, but, but what happens is, you know, not just for Bosch, but it happened on, uh, you know, Fear of the Walking Dead and other projects that I've been on, uh, even Boardwalk Empire, when you have a brand new director, and now they're contradicting everything that the previous director was saying. <laughs> right, right. And it just drives you fucking bananas, you know. And I don't like to be confrontational on a set because it just upsets everything. So I right. kind of like, okay, uh, you know, choosing my battles. And it's just very frustrating. I wish it was some other way. And, I'm, and I know that there are certain shows that just use one director throughout. Uh, but that's very rare. Yeah. Yeah, but it is it is challenging for an actor to have different points of view come in and kind of like contradict um, things that have already uh, have had a, a, an ongoing process, you know. Yeah, and I can see as an actor where you love to have any actor would love to have that freedom because. You wouldn't stand behind an artist who's doing a painting and saying, you know what, that needs more blue, that needs... I mean, the artist knows what he's doing or she's doing. Same thing with acting. Let them do what they know, right? That's that's just such a great point you brought up. Yeah, yeah. You know, unless you know someone, you know, there's so I won't say who that someone is because uh, I, I don't, I don't want to offend other people. There's, you know, one writer that would come up to me and would give me suggestions. And I said, you know what? This guy really knows what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and I told him, you know what? You you have, hey, I'm giving you the license to come up to me and tell me anything that you want. Because he understood the characters. He understood the scripts. And he was there day in and day out. And many times he would just, Say something and it just many times would say something which would enlighten the whole scene the whole character so you have those rare exceptions right no no that makes sense and uh i can't thank you enough because you like i said you've almost given me an hour um he's a legend he is paul calderon paul thank you so much i can't thank you enough Derek, thank you so much. It's been, you know, it was a lot of fun. Like I said, I thought we'd only been on for about 15 minutes, but you said it's close to an hour. So thank you so much. It's 
been very entertaining.